Right. Cool. Um, let's see. Welcome, everybody. If anybody is even out there yet, but uh, if you're not yet, they will be soon. We are super excited today to have uh, our guests for our storytellers uh, panel discussion. And our, we have two very special guests today with us right now, Meredith Lyons and Douglas Webster. And we are uh, waiting on Duncan Wambu. Hopefully he's able to join us all the way from Kenya. It's very late there right now, but we're um, hoping he can make it on here at, uh, in a few minutes. So just real quick, um, I just need to share this, don't I? Yeah. We're just gonna go through. Um, and give you all a little bit of background on our guest speakers today. <laughs> so, um, oh, look at that. They're, they're lovely faces. <laughs> there we are. All right. Meredith Lyons is a dancer, educator, choreographer, and administrator <clears throat> based in the Northeast. Her physical performance technique is focused heavily in articulate movement vocabulary. And, and, oh, wait, it just keeps on going, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to read that out loud. Oh, goodness. All right. Here, let's do it this way. There so we go. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, she's uh, essentially she's uh, internationally, um, internationally known as a dancer and choreographer. We had the pleasure of working with Meredith at Colorado Mesa University a few years back, and uh, we got to collaborate on a number of projects while she was here. Next up is Miano or Duncan Wambugu. Uh, we hope he is able to join us soon, a native of Nairobi, Kenya. Duncan is currently on faculty at Kenyatta University's Department of Music and Dance in Nairobi as a lecturer. He graduated with a PhD in music education from the School of Music at the University of Florida in 2012, which is where we met him, and we sang in his fabulous choir, Pazani Sauti, uh, which was an African choir that he founded in 2009. In 2011, he was appointed as the musical director for the Safari Khan Classical Fusion Festival, which featured, among others, the world-renowned vocal group Ladysmith Black Mombazo and Kenya's own Sauti Soul. He has written and presented several papers on various aspects of performance of African art music, music education, in national and international music conferences and workshops. His PhD thesis explored the rationale for the use of Kenyan choral art music in high school music curriculum in Kenya. And last but not least, we have Doug Webster. Douglas Webster is an international vocal artist performing with symphony orchestras, opera, and in solo recital. As an actor, he's appeared on Broadway, national tours, and in regional theater. He has received the Portland Grammy Award for Best Actor in a Musical for Les Miserables, and the Phoenix Theater Encore Award for Best Actor, also in Les Miserables, and Best Supporting Actor in The Light in the Piazza. Oops. And as the celebrant in Leonard Bernstein's Mass, he has led over 20 productions, including those at Carnegie Hall, Kennedy Center, festivals at Aspen, Grillo, and Tanglewood, with the symphonies in Dallas, Denver, Portland, Columbus, Eugene, and internationally in Spain, Lithuania, and Latvia. His 25-year affiliation with Mass began while he was a graduate student at Indiana University, performing the composer's 70th birthday gala at the Tanglewood Festival in 1988. And his hand-picked cast are featured in the culture video release of Bernstein's Mass at the Vatican. He and his wife, cellist Liz Bird, share their homes in Portland and South Park, Colorado. Yes, that's South Park, also where I hail from, <laughs> with dogs of undetermined origin named Cabela and Humphrey. Very nice. So uh, just real quick before we get rocking and rolling here, um, Doug, did you have something to say? Yeah, I forgot to send you the 100-word hundred, hundred concise bio, and I apologize. Same <laughs> no right. problem. Right. I can I concise them uh, from your website. <laughs> oh my! I, I know that's what webs websites are, are are basically replacing our mothers. It's like you want to hear yes, my exactly. You want to hear everything I did out of college? Just call my mom. There you go. She's she's there gone now. Go. I have a website. Sorry oh, about that. That's okay. That's okay. So I'm before sorry, we get back into rolling, yeah, I just said ahead. I. I well, no, you read it beautifully, but I got bored about halfway through, and I I thought, is it? 
I, I was wondering, I wanted to take a sip of coffee and I thought, is it rude if I'm drinking during my own introduction? That's <laughs> I know, I'm I don't sorry. know if anybody can see you right now, but um, that's okay. We're gonna get started in just a moment here, but before we do, just real quick, uh, we're gonna go through, uh, take a couple minutes to to talk about um, what we do with Sing for Your Lives. And so, what is, is Sing for Your Lives anyway? It is a unique series of workshops and master classes, a course designed to teach you to free your voice, transform yourself connect your community and heal the world. So how we free your voice is through a, a combination of a number of things here, a holistic vocal technique that takes into account a number of different things, body awareness, the mind, body, heart, and soul connection. We help you to align yourself, not just physically, but also mentally, emotionally, and we help you to find your true voice. We teach you to transform yourself. We teach life lessons disguised as voice lessons, such as relinquish control to gain control and connection over perfection. We deal with the biochemical changes that occur in our bodies when we sing and the parasympathetic nervous system stimulation that helps calm our minds and bodies. We recognize shifting unconscious habits that exist in our, in our everyday life and in our voices. And we help to connect your community. Whenever we sing together, we're building empathy and compassion. We talk about the cardio energetics or soul resonance. What happens when we sing with emotion and what is happening with our hearts emitting emotional information that is picked up by other people. We talk about psychoacoustics, the way that sound affects our minds and our bodies. And overall, more important than anything, we we focus on how to use, uh, sorry, how to use singing to create connections and dissolve divisions. And when we all do that, when we work together, we use singing to heal the world. So to find out more about what we do with Sing for Your Lives, aside from these free webinars, uh, go to singforyourlives.com and see see what we're all about. We are booking workshops for our next semester, and if you're interested, we would be more than happy to talk to your school. So, oh, without any further ado, <clears throat> let's get talking. So we have uh, we have some questions that we want to discuss with with all of you. Um, first off, is why is storytelling important to? Why is that an important part of the human condition? Just open it up to you, Doug. What do you think? <laughs> the human condition. Um... Well, my human condition, I was, I was realizing that my dog was being picked up in the feed. He's, the, the, he's discovered the squirrel. So that's not a human condition, but I guess it is. Um, I think part of the human condition is that we, we need to communicate. And it's, it's been vital um, in this time where we've all, we're, you know, this is the world of duck and cover. We've all self-isolated. Um, ostensibly to protect ourselves, but, you know, what are we really protecting ourselves by isolating? Um, or are we just uh, atrophying as a, as a community? Um, and that's the, that is a big concern of mine, that we need to reach out for each other. Um, you know, we, we, we are so media dependent because it's, we're online. We're, we're being fed and nurtured by anything that's electronic that can talk to us. And that communication stream has been absconded with, or at least made taken advantage of, by groups that are interested in, in proffering their opinion and their point of view. And good, bad, or ugly, it doesn't really matter what point of view it is, it, because it's not balanced. And it's not kind. And I think that storytelling um, inherently is about kindness and about community and sharing that. And I think um, we are particularly vulnerable right now as a community because we are limited from human contact and we are uh, desperate for input. And so we open up the airwaves and it all comes in. You know, anyone, anyone can reach us. And sometimes we're reached and hurt and then we back away. But what if, you know, what, what is our guarantee that we can be nurtured through a communication? 
And there is really no guarantee right now when our communication is via online. And that is my concern about the human condition is that we're vulnerable. Yeah. It's been so fascinating to us. We've talked about this since, um, since shortly after the, the pandemic hit and everybody quarantined that we all, especially artists, I find um, we had to find a way to make our art. And we had to find a way to connect. And so it was so fascinating how quickly all of these different means of connecting, of, of sharing our art popped up. But even though we have Zoom, even though we have, you know, we have all of these StreamYard or, or any other technological advancements that are helping us to have some type of connection, it just doesn't seem the same as being able to touch each other and sit across from each other and have these discussions. Um, yeah, absolutely. Meredith, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, what I love about you bringing us all together, uh, when you're saying sing for your lives, uh, for those that don't know that long bio, um, <laughs> is that uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a dancer, a dance artist, a choreographer, director, administrator, like all the things that you can do in the performing arts, but I lend myself to dance and have my entire life. And so my method of communication and what I teach and when I, where I work with others is actually a nonverbal communication. And so uh, we have a different way of singing and we sing through our bodies. And so for me, storytelling has always been inherent to dance. A lot of, that's a lot of the times actually what we're doing is we're telling stories. So when I think about the human condition, I then think about how we're teaching culture, how we're teaching other people's stories. Uh, you know, we could be teaching our own stories. We're, it, there's a lot of cultural implications that can happen through the way that we teach dance or the way that we share dance together. And then, and then I know, I know Graham knows this, is that a lot of times in my choreography, I try to work with students or others to, to speak about a potential issue at hand that's affecting the human condition or the way that humans occupy the land. And, and, I, and I most commonly do that in a super subliminal way. Sometimes people say it's like super right in your face. And so I think it, you know, it depends on the audience. It depends on the people that, are, that you're sharing it with. Uh, but when, we, when I think about the human condition in regards to storytelling and then I look at it in a nonverbal way, it, to me, it's a lot more of how we can share our past histories and then into our future history. And so interestingly, in other styles of the performing arts, Zoom has become this way of, of how we communicate. And some things have come really great from that and some things not so much. Uh, I can speak definitely for dance is that we, are, we have absolutely no interaction. And, and dancing, while you are in, individually inside yourself, is most commonly shared and you're in a space together. And so this particular performing art and discipline uh, has really taken a massive, massive backseat and uh, with people losing their jobs. And, and also we're so used to telling our stories or other people's stories that because it's so palpable of how emotional it has been for so many of us, nobody wants to tell their stories anymore because the stories are so bad. And after a while, like you're just hearing such bad stories over and over and over again, you're already feeling it for yourself and you're hearing it from others. And so if anything, this is like really shut people down. And which is, it's just to me is a really interesting situation because it's most commonly the way that we share the dance, literally. Um, so that's why I was so excited to be on here today uh, because I, we don't always get the opportunity to really talk about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're all in our little do silos. You, do you feel like, um, I feel like I really connect with people to their voices. And I wonder if when you meet someone, um, whether consciously or subconsciously or unconsciously, how much you become aware of their bodies and how they move their bodies and how much um, how much your interaction with them sort of depends on their body language. 100%, that's, that's, that's how I feel like immediately how I can get to know somebody. Uh, and it, it's like inherent inside of me. I, 
I've had to really think about it a lot more in the past probably five years, but I would always think to myself, like, how do the people not understand that that person communicates in this particular way? I, and I, I just learned that a lot of that is just through like being in space together all the time when you're dancing and in different venues and different, in different studios and on stage, as we, as you know, you, we all know when we're, when we're performing on stage, there is so much that's happening that we can't say. And uh, no matter what the performance, the performing art is. And so there's so much communication happening w amongst each other. And then also in regards to the audience and then how that comes back and forth with one another. And a lot of that is, is not through words or sound. Uh, and so, yeah, when I'm communicating with people, like I'm super conscious of how I'm standing or like how to try to create the space for everyone to be in there. Or if I'm purposely trying to shut something off or shut it down. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very conscious of that. And I'm also conscious of how others are doing that. And then when they don't even know what they're doing, like sometimes people just, they just have no idea that uh, the way that they're potentially making the space for each other. Fascinating. Doug, I have, I'm always fascinated when you perform, there's all, every song has a story attached to it. And that's I, like, I mean, obviously listening to you sing is a joy in itself, but then I, it's so enthralling to hear all of your stories that are connected to all of these songs that you perform. How does that, um, do you feel like that is part of the story that you weave into your performance? Or do you feel like there are sort of separate stories of your life and then of the lives of the, the characters that you're performing? Um, most of it has to do with the fact that if I don't connect with the song or the story, I'm not interested. Uh, I have a very short attention span. I'm not a good student. I have not been um, academically driven to learn something for the esoteric purpose of learning something. Um, if there was no payoff, I wasn't interested. Um, and, you know, that's a kind of a harsh, harsh way to say it. And I'm, you know, <laughs> it's going to kill my chances of being a professor again. But I, I really, um, I, as you said that, I was imagining myself in the stacks of the library at Indiana University which was massive. Uh, it's a huge music library. And I would go in and I would just start pulling books off the shelves. Um, I'd find a composer I liked and I'd just dig and I would sit there and, you know, I had rudimentary skills as a sight reader, but I would sit and read the poetry. And then I'd, I'd hum through the, the melodies and see if there was some kind of a hook that would, that would seem to work for me. Or I had, um, crazy high note skills. I could, you know, I could, pull off trick shots because I was basically a lazy tenor who didn't want to work that hard. So I called myself a baritone and slept in, but I, um, I found some songs that really moved me and, or they were, there was something about them that, that had an intrinsic value to me as a, as a lazy, you know, <laughs> lazy tenor. Um, but you, the, to what you're talking about is by the time I get it to the stage and by the time it's crafted into a show, it's a presentation of a menu. And it's a menu that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I, you know, I'm the guy with the note cards. I'm scattered across the piano, shifting them back and forth to see, okay, does this song lead into this song? Um, I'm trained as a recitalist. So I'm trained to look at key relationships and so if I change a, a key in the middle of the Dichtelebe, a Schumann, I find one, one song is up, is it going to hit another one at the tritone? And that's a, you know, that's a desperate wrong if you're a trained musician. Or you tell a joke in the middle and nobody remembers what key it was and they go on. Of course, if you tell a joke in the middle of the Dichtelebe, you're inherently wrong anyway, and they're going to be horrified that you're even talking instead of singing. So nobody's even thinking about the key relation, the relationship. Um, but when I come into a, a, a song recital, and that's really what it is. It looks like an evening with me singing. It's a recital. And I won all these recital prizes. I, surprisingly, I, I realized I've got all these theater awards that you mentioned on my re website, but none of, none of the recital awards. You know, I'm a, this card-carrying recitalist in a country that doesn't pay well for recitalists. I thought, wow, what a waste of time. 
I've got these awards saying, you know, Joy in Singing Concert Artist Guild. They look great on paper and for people who know, but they don't care in Kansas. They want to know, can you sing Cole Porter? Can you tell a joke? And I will, I will sneak in some, you know, some of my loftier goal songs that I've learned in, in, you know, in academia. But if they don't tell a story that can relate to me, I don't tell it well. And if I can't tell it well, then the audience isn't going to really feel the, the empathy that the song needs. Um, when it comes to opera, you know, there are operas that are 200 years old and they're in Latin or I'm not Latin, they're in, in Italian. And people sitting in the sticks who don't speak Italian are crying at the end of these operas because they were so beautiful and the story was so well, tell, well told. They have no idea what the words were. But the, the, in our essence, you know, Meredith is talking about visual aspects. Operas survive because there's a resonant aspect of our storytelling and where we resonate and the, the body literally of the audience feels the resonance of our energy, which does all of the work for us. And then we throw a couple of hints, either text or lighting or some stage craft so people know where they are in the play. But meanwhile, they just feel it viscerally. And I think that's one of the magical things about storytelling as a musician and a singer, is that you use that aspect to, to yeah. add to, to the story. Doug, that makes me think. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so you said that it's called song resonance? Well, uh, it's no, the, we call that soul resonance. Soul but resonance. It's not, you're not resonating your voice, it's your soul, it's your mm. emotions, it's your spirit that it gets resonated. And there's scientific reasons for this um, that we talk about in our workshops. Um, but absolutely. That's mm -hmm. it's not, yeah, it's, it's a combination of your sound being resonated and your emotional energy <clears throat> that's being resonated that they can measure. And it when that kind of double whammy hits people, that's what you know, that's the tears start flowing and they have no idea why. Like, I don't know why I'm crying, but I feel things right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's a super powerful thing. And so I think the reason we wanted to do this, this discussion today and to bring in um, not just singers, but, you know, people from, from various different artistic uh, paths, because one of the things that we've been really, the two of us have been talking about for a while now is how all of the different arts whether performing arts or, or otherwise, you know, painting, writing, um, what have you, Literature, yeah. they're all telling stories, <laughs> right? In, in some way or another, whether it's a, an explicit story, like here's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's an antagonist, protagonist, or if it's just a picture, you know, it could be a portrait, or a song oftentimes is just, it's like a musical portrait. There's not really action, but it's telling the story of an emotional event or an emotional reaction that somebody had at some point. And so in all of these different art forms, we're, we're basically telling the story of what it means to be human and some aspect of a human experience and then sharing that with other people to say, hey, whether you have consciously had this experience or not, this exists within you somewhere and you have the capacity to feel this as well. And if we both have the capacity to feel this, then we have some kind of whole humanity. And there's really the divisions that seem like so real between us can't touch that. And so that's, I think, one of the most powerful things that we do is that we tell these stories in order to remind ourselves that, hey, we are all human. Yeah. We all have the same kind of fundamental essence to us. And these stories are how we remember that and how we recognize that. And beyond that, I think it makes us, uh, it gives us the power, the power to sort of shape who we are and recognizing in someone else, recognizing in a character or in, you know, a ballet, whatever it is that um, you recognize elements of yourself mm -hmm. in the characters that are being portrayed. We're holding up a mirror for our audience to, audiences to see who they're being at that moment. And once they see themselves reflected back, that gives them the, the power, the tools to correct things that they don't like or dig into things that they do and celebrate themselves in ways that they maybe wouldn't have previously. Absolutely. Yeah. Meredith, did you have something you wanted to say? 
Yeah, I was just thinking when Doug was <coughs> talking, um, was when you're talking about that soul resonance, I was then also thinking of um, through movement from an audience perspective, let's just say you're seeing a performance of, let's just put a company up there and they have high athleticism. There's like heavy breathing, potentially no sound in terms of like a musical score. And, but what we are feeling and seeing and taking in is the exertion. And, and if that's like heavy impact and it's extremely fast and your, your, your sensory overload of what that comes in as, it has another resonance within versus like, let's just say a, maybe a very specific stylized classical ballet where they are extremely physical, but you can't hear it. And, and so then you have this like, they're over there and I'm over here. Feeling. <laughs> And they're, and they're two different feelings. Like depending on the choreography that you're seeing and the style of dance, the audience will take in that physicality into the body. And so it has a similar but also dissimilar way that sound does. But the, the exertion of breath and hearing the breath and feeling it and then witnessing it has a really interesting relationship to an individual's way of how they take in say a story or how they take in that physicality within themselves. There's a lot of people that leave an audience after seeing a dance performance where they physically either get like exuberantly excited or they get, they walk away feeling like, wow, I just something like really impactful just overtook my body, even though it's still from afar. So there is like this wave that happens when, when we watch so much exertion happening from another, similar to like when people say they watch sports now it's a, it's a to, it's not that it's totally different, but it's ha, it, there's a disassociation with it, as it is for the performing arts. And I, it just it just sort of I don't really ever get to talk to anybody about that. Like I I love watching the audience. I love watching them from the corner, and seeing what happens that, the translation between the two, from the stage or let's just say maybe in the round, um, so we take away that fourth wall just that the relationship of what each one gets and gives and, and, and also through singing, it, you know, it's not just for dance, but just the sharing of the performing art and how that you can literally watch the wave, like hit the audience and then how the audience has the <laughs> wave that comes back to the performer. And or sometimes we see it in comedians as well. You just, you see, it's a given take that happens back and forth. And to me, that's, that's where the story lies, is that back and forth, that wave that happens back and forth. And it's not always what happens like afterwards where you sort of talk about the performance. A lot of times it's really right then and there. And the practice that it, it is as a performer over time to be able to take in what the audience is giving you through potentially no sound at all is, is something that we all, all of us right now, really know what that feels like. And that can sometimes have an extreme high and an extreme low. And it, it has this wave that you have to ride and then how you deal with that afterwards. Cause you're really sharing so much of yourself and potentially the story that you're giving as well, where you're trying to share and educate and take people on a potential ride um, and hoping that that they're potentially going where you want them to maybe go or or take away a little nugget of what, what it is that you're sharing. I love that talking about the like reciprocal energy that we feel with our audience. And we feed each other, you know? We all, all performers know this feeling of being on the stage and we're giving so much and the audience is just dead. And the we feel so drained at the end of that versus the yeah. show where the audience is alive and they're present and they're excited about what we have to say. And so they're feeding us and we're feeding them and we're just so revitalized at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And I also love that you talked about the breath. I mean, we talk about in Sync for Your Lives, we talk about um, the muscles of inspiration and expiration when we're breathing in and out, it's not breath, it's spirit. We are inspiring. This is where, you know, the derivative of this word. And so it's, we are breathing in the spirit of one another. When we are in this shared space, when we are in this shared moment and this shared reality that we're creating on the stage, it's like, yeah, we, we get to create this, this um, sort of symbiotic relationship in that moment with the audience. You, mm -hmm. you know, not to be like academic y, um, but I am gonna like throw in a scholar. Her name's Andrea Olson, and she uh, taught at Middlebury. 
in Vermont for quite a long time. And um, she has this book that she talks about um, that's talking about your body and your somatics and, and the history that you have that you, your body brings in. And this is not just specific to dance as we know, but so she talks about your movement history. And we all have, a, every single person has a movement history because we've all moved our bodies at some point in time. And so in the sharing of that breath, in that symbiotic relationship, when we're all together and then we have this movement history, we're all coming into that space with our own physicality. And so how we share that, whether that's through singing, through dance, that's our bodies moving through space. And we're all breathing beings coming together and sharing that. And that to me is the interesting story because we all are taking what is inherent inside of us that's then having a shared story to then share with others. And I think a lot about that in relationship to people talking about how artists have such an ego and, hmm. and how it's all about them in the performance and the addiction to performing. And I think a lot about how, actually, no, it's just that we're, we're sharing stories together. And yes, do you have a thrill potentially in performing? Some people hate performing, but really love the art and really love sharing and how to make the art. Maybe the performing is not that huge to them, but I think a lot about how that's like embedded within us in our movement industry. And then I think about how that's then shared and, and it's multi-layered, right? Like for people that are not potentially in the performing arts, a lot of times they think it's, it is really just about me and I wanna be seen. And to me, I think a lot about how it's actually, no, it's that I'm sharing something with others collectively and then within an audience perspective as well yeah. mm -hmm. i think absolutely i think a lot of the, the <clears throat> that conception of the artist ego and everything is well founded in some cases though because i think there you know there definitely are plenty of performers that do kind of get addicted to the high of, of the applause and and just the high of a performance and they lose sight of, or maybe never had a real good idea of why they're doing this in the first place beyond just how it makes them feel. Um, they don't really get the storytelling thing or they don't get the connection thing happened. And so, um, you know, I've, I've watched an interview with a number of different singers a while back. It was happened at the Kennedy Center. And one of them was this uh, young opera singer who's he's singing at the Met now um, and incredible voice, obviously, but he didn't really get it. You could tell, like, he just didn't get this. And he was talking about, well, you, you got to have good technique and you got to be able to, you know, deliver the right sound all the time. And you got to be on point. And it's like, that's the first step, but that's not it. That's not really not what it's all about. Yeah. Um, you're not communicating anything to anybody that way, regardless of how beautiful your voice is. Um, so I think, yeah, there are plenty of, egos out there because they uh they miss the they miss the point so that's a big part of what we're trying to do with this workshop series is get people to see that point you know be technically perfect that's great like sound as good as you can sound but make sure that you're connecting with people make sure that you're telling a story that's going to impact somebody yeah. and make sure that what you do actually has purpose and meaning beyond just making pretty pretty noises or pretty movements or right. you know pretty pictures or whatever it is there's got to be something deeper beyond it the technique serves the, the emotion not the other way around mm -hmm. and the message. yeah and the message doug um I actually this is not one of the questions that we sent you out <laughs> beforehand but i'm i'm curious about um for you, since you two of your big roles that you've you've embodied over the years are Jean Valjean from Les Mis and the celebrant from Bernstein's Mass. Um, so, how do those when with as much time as you spent on each of these people, these characters, um, what do they what do they say about everybody? You talked about this kind of being the everyman story. Like, how does Talk to, us, talk to us a little bit about how those characters can be seen in everybody. Well, um, I think in the sense that <clears throat> the celebrant in Bernstein's Mass was set up to be an everyman character. Uh, he had you know, 
crisis of faith over the course of the show. He starts out as a priest, and at the end, we don't know if he's left the priesthood, bailed completely on it, uh, or had a resurgence of faith. We don't really know what's what's happened. Um, we see him as the pivotal point while everyone else is going through their own personal version of hell. And uh, how that equates to, to Valjean is he's basically the same guy. Uh, Valjean, you know, made a bad choice or was forced into a bad choice as a young man and pay the cost of, for 19 years incarceration and then begins his life again. Um, I think people can identify with these characters that, you know, of wasted time or lost time or self-isolation that I believe something in the rest of the world doesn't. Um, and you hold, do you hold tight with your, with your beliefs or do you change? Or, you know, in the case of Valjean, he was, he was treated like a criminal for, for two dozen years. And he was a criminal until he was offered a moment of grace, just the slightest snapshot of grace in the midst of his, his lifespan, where a bishop gives him the silver and says, hey, I'm buying, you, I'm buying you off. And in that moment, uh, in, at least in the play, or at least in the drama of Les Miserables, he makes a choice. And I think we're all offered the opportunity of choice on a daily basis, on a, on a moment to moment basis. We are one series of choices. If you look over, if you've ever sailed a sailboat badly, you can look over your shoulder and you see all the minute misdirections of, you know, the choices of too much rudder, too little rudder. And, you know, I've, <laughs> speaking for myself, I've looked over the back of a, a sailboat and watched how badly I sail a boat. Um, same thing with the course of life. You know, we look back over our, our paths and we can look at every misstep and every error we make and judge ourselves for it, but it's in the past. You know, judgment looking backwards doesn't do you any good because you'll trip over something on the way because you're, you need to look forward. And I think that is the message of most theater events that I've been in that it's about moving forward, it's about looking forward, it's about making choices in every moment and not just drifting through. Um, because we have to choose. We're not on autopilot. I'd mentioned before, there are plenty of people out in the world that will offer you choice and make it easy to choose. You can choose by inactively not choosing. We'll vote for you, just, just stay at home. We'll make sure everything's just the way we want it. You just stay home. Um, and you know what I'm talking about, that it's, it's manipulation on a grand scale. And storytelling belies that. Storytelling shows you an example of self-reliance or self-belief. Uh, and you see that it can be done. We, we say, well, Valjean pulled his life out. Uh, the celebrant held tight until he couldn't. And in his despair, others recognized themselves and finally identified with themselves. And it becomes a happy ending. You know, not, I can't say the, the Bernstein Mass has a happy ending. It has a hopeful ending. It has a moment of possibility. Or it could just go back to what it was. But there's that moment where this lift and in dance, it's the same. When there's a when there's a, a lift, there's this uplifting moment. Before gravity takes hold of us again, there's that hope and possibility. And then it's really how we land and where we go from there. And I think that's the exciting part. You know, it's the high note in a song. Yeah, it's exciting to hear the high note, but it's where it's going to that people get excited. People don't cry when they hear a high note. They cry when the note is finished and it's resolved. And it, the full emphasis of that is when f people feel it. You know, I grew up watching Barishnikov. He's, people didn't applaud when he was in the air. They applauded after he landed it. And you, the full impact of what he did hits you. And so choice in the moment is up to us, but the, the, 
the ripple effect comes after. So we'll tell stories. The ripple effect is people going home and talking about it. Um, I'll end with, I met Bernstein and, you know, he, he, put, he put the Bernstein mass together to prod people. You know, Nixon was in the White House and this is just before Watergate blew up. Um, he meant to prod people. It was intentional. And the best compliment I got from a friend of mine, uh, who's now the director of the Sarasota uh, Opera, again, Rich Russell. Um, he's a dear, dear colleague of mine. And I, I admire him deeply for what he's doing. They're performing now. Uh, they've opened their season. They're distant. They don't have that many people in the house. They've got, they've reprogrammed their season to two and three character pieces so that they can keep their, you know, their safety while they're telling stories. Um, he came up to me after our first pr production of the Bernstein Mass, and he he thanked me for my performance. You know, we we're young kids, we were, you know, 24, 25. And I said, hey, we're going out, you know, we're going out for a beer afterwards. And he said, okay, thanks. And he went home. The next day I said, I missed, I missed seeing you. Where'd you go? And he said, I sat in a chair and watched the sun come up literally sat overnight thinking about what his faith was as a, as a young um, Catholic kid in upstate New York and an altar server. And he, he went through his own cathartic uh, decisions of what choices he's made and what, what choices he was. And he, was, he said, I was wide awake. And he said, okay, I stayed and watched the sun come up as I was pondering who I was and what this meant to me. I've never since 25 productions later i've i've never had a compliment more sincere or more more dearly treasured than that that i made him think or at least something that i participated in gave him permission and opportunity to be self respective uh, introspective and yeah. that's all you can hope for in our in our profession Absolutely. I think that that's the whole point. You know, you, you said earlier, like we don't run on autopilot. We make choices every everything we do. Um, and I think we have the opportunity to make choices in everything that we do. But I think a lot of times we really do end up uh, going through our lives unaware of the fact that we're, we're making those choices. We're, we're kind of unconsciously doing all these you know, you brush your teeth and then you forget that you brushed your teeth. You don't even remember that you did it because it's on autopilot. But when we tell these stories and we're showing people, hey, here's some aspect of yourself, it does exactly what you just said. It's like it causes you to look inward and be introspective in a way that brings your awareness to all of these kind of unconscious habits that we have. And then when you have awareness of those habits, then you have the ability to choose to do something differently if you want or not. But if, when you're not aware of those things, you're kind of just being swept along. Yeah. And so we're basically, we're holding up a mirror for people to say, here's what you are. Here's, or what's, here's something that it lays dormant within you potentially and do something about it. We in this we did a master class like we mentioned to you all. Uh, we did a master class with some students yesterday. We were talking about some of these concepts, and one of them asked, um, "What if what if the character that you have to portray is not one that you really want to portray? What if it's an ugly character, or the, you know, something that is unsavory?" And we said, "You have even more responsibility to portray that." I, I, we've talked about this a million times, but um, the movie American History X, um, I don't know if you've all seen it, but it's Edward Norton and he plays a skinhead, a neo Nazi. Uh, and at the beginning of the movie, there's this awful graphic scene where he kills a black man. And so then he goes to prison for it. Um, and you hate him. You hate him so passionately, so intensely. And I didn't want to see for, you know, for a little bit and he i won't tell you the whole story but uh he turns his life around in it um but i didn't i was like i couldn't do it i don't know why he was so good at being a skinhead maybe and that, that was his job because if he hadn't done that i wouldn't have left as hateful i wouldn't have left as angry that this exists 
you know? And so his authenticity in this dark and awful character made me recognize the reality of that situation in life and lit a fire to do something about it. And I wouldn't have if he hadn't done a good job, you know? Yeah, stuff that makes me think so much about, um, again, through the performing arts, but I love, of course, my medium is dance. And so there's so many times when people will come up to me and, and say, well, it's supposed to be pretty. It's supposed to be, and what does that even mean? Like pretty is so relative of a term, but, and then it's supposed to be happy. You're supposed to make people feel good. You're supposed to give them a space to get away from their lives. So everyone's lives are horrendous all the time. Um, but like, you know, like that idea of that we are here for people's joy. That we are yeah. distracted yeah. yeah. from their lives. Mm -hmm. From their lives and that I need to provide them a, a place for enjoyment, fulfillment, uh, that's going to bring them to a positive level. And if anything, I, that's when I normally, I like take the like breaks and I like completely go back even more, which <laughs> like for me, I have to practice not doing that more. Like anytime anyone says that to me, it gets me fired up like a little too much. Uh, and so, and I think a lot about that. Like for me, it's really hard and it's not fulfilling to make like happy dances or pretty dances. Like I, like for people to do that, I think it's an amazing skill and to be able to to create these these kind of dances that people also have a great appreciation of what they're seeing and um i mean i think they're all skills in terms of what it is that you're making with art but for me on the way that i'm going in and i'm making art it always comes from a place of and like i'm jumping into some of the questions is is it comes from a place of is there a story to be told is there something to be learned in this story and as you said, Steph, what can we take away from it? What can what can the viewer take away? Potentially, what are they learning? What are they learning about themselves? What are they learning about the situation at hand? And sometimes that's just a movement thing. It doesn't have to be like a full blown historical story. Uh, it doesn't have to have like such a huge amount of information given. Sometimes it's just like a sense of euphoria or sometimes it's a sense of like sadness or fear or it's an emotional thing. I But I... The, the way that I think about how to do that is is through whoever the people are that I'm using, whether it's myself or through others in, in terms of choreography. And then I think of the sound and then I think of whatever the image is aside from our bodies, what they're wearing, project if there's projection, if there's props, if there's whatever else is additional to space, what is the space that we're creating and we're making? And, and then try to educate the people that I'm working with, because as you, as Doug had said of, and, and that you, everyone has said right now is that what it is that the individual is sharing with the viewer has a lot to do with what it is that they are individually sharing. And so if they don't know how to tap into that character or to tap into the idea of what they're doing, then, then they, then they're not going to succeed. So I'm going to have to train and coach. And, and if they don't know any of it, I have to teach them that information. And, and then I have to learn how to teach them that. Cause what if they're super resistant and they don't, I, I can just give like one example. When I was in, when I was at CMU, Colorado Mesa in Grand Junction, I was working with these college students and I had this particular piece of music. I had, I was in, I had been in Istanbul, Turkey to teach and was presented at a conference in Greece. And I heard this like sound and I was between, if you know the Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque, and they, there was a call and response that was happening of this prayer. And, and everybody came you know, down on their knees and they, and they went into prayer. But there was like a train going by and there was tourists and I was a tourist. And this just amazing sound of this call and response between these two men, between these two spaces. And I was in the middle of the two spaces that I just like picked up my phone and did a voice memo. Cause I was like, I have to remember this. This sound is so inside my body and, it, and I have to take this forward. And for me, this is what it, my experience of Turkey was. So fast forward a couple of years, I used that sound, sent it to a good friend who works at the University of Utah, Michael Wall, and he created this sound score because I was really hesitant to have it be played at Colorado Mesa in Grand Junction because the timing, the election just happened. I was brand new there. 
I was just an odd duck. <laughs> It, yeah, right. Non traditional. This maybe the first time somebody's ever he heard that prayer happen back and forth, not understanding the important uh, the musical notes that are going back and forth, not understanding that there's obviously a, a cultural component that's going on in there, the way that they hear that. And then, how do I then put that onto dance to this situation of the context at hand? And I remember having a student that was like, This is completely against my faith. And so, I remember saying, like, kind of posing a question: How, what, what about it is against your faith? Because this is not a religious-based dance. This is not a religious-based. This isn't religious-based. This, this call and response. You don't know what they're saying, actually. And so, th this, this language that's happening back and forth, and the way that we hear that language, or, or what we think that what we're hearing, or somebody else told us what that was. You know, to be able to unpack all of that with, with a college student to try to get them to then take it on, to then convey the meaning of that to a potential audience that's not gonna take that in. Like, I think a lot of people don't realize in the performing arts how much we are like negotiating with people, how much we are like having to really unpack people's stories and how we have to really take a backseat on how to do that, the way that we have to communicate with one another, the way that we, re we really have to read the room, we have to figure out how best to communicate that information so that the, the story, the image, whatever it is that we're trying to portray, like how much we really have to negotiate who we are to those that we're working with at hand. No, yeah, absolutely. Another level there. No, that's that's, that's <laughs> that makes me laugh. Um, I mean, in a good way. I uh, you, I totally get talk about unpacking. Um, when I was at the Vatican, we I was asked to come in and, and help produce uh, the Bernstein Mass production there, and and it had been it been pushed back. They tried to cancel it. A number of cardinals. Uh, we're trying to stop it because it was, you know, it was, it was sacrilegious. But uh, John Paul II viewed it as a, as a passion play. That it was a, it was literally a passion play and that, that it really had a, a place at the Vatican. And we did it. Um, just before the performance, uh, I was handed these tickets. They look like Willy Wonka golden tickets, but they were introductory tickets to, to meet the pontiff for an audience, a private audience. And the, the archbishop who was in charge of wrangling us handed me these. And I said, he said, here's one for you and your kid. And here's, here's one for the, the boy soprano. Well, I'd flown in twins. They both were performing. And I said, well, I said, there's two of them. I said, I, I've only got one ticket. He said, oh, well, that's a, you know, there's problems. Um, they finally, you know, came up with another ticket. Well, I asked, I called the boy's moms and a mom who's there. And I said, Hey, listen, I, there's a possibility of introducing the boys to the, to the Pope. Um, how do you feel about that? And I had members of my cast who would crawl for, you know, a year and a half on their knees to have an audience with the Pope. They're Catholic. They're devout. This is, this was a big deal. And here's a couple of kids. And she said, well, we're raising them atheist, but I think that might be interesting. And I didn't know what to say because I thought, well, wait a minute. There are these people for whom it would be a life altering experience. And this, th this woman I talked to is treating it like it's a trip to the zoo. It might be interesting to watch. And I, I didn't know what to do. So I called, I actually had communication with the uh, ambassador to the Vatican at the time and her secretary spoke with me and I said, what do you do? I mean, so what, what, what literally do I do? I, I'm at a loss. And he said, well, you know, I don't have an opinion really other than to say if 12 year old boys are being raised one way, um, when you're 12, you, you're raised with the faith of your, your parents. And who's to say that meeting the most important or powerful Christian on the planet might not open their eyes to the possibility of something else? 
not to proselytize, but just, you know, just to say, here's this real guy. And I thought, okay. And the boys met the Pope. And the boys are doing fine. They're prominent jazz musicians in New York now. And I really learned a lesson for myself saying it's like any opportunity, you know, is, is an experience. Um, as you know, Meredith was saying, unpacking. Well, the boys weren't packed yet. And I haven't had that conversation with him. Did that make an, you know, of course it made an impression, but did it make an impression in any way, you know, philosophically for them? Skip ahead a few years later, I'm walking into a, a rehearsal of the Bernstein Mass at George Mason University in Washington. And I'd found out 10 minutes before that not only was I coming as a guest professor and an artist and to sing the, the role and do some master classes, I was also staging the thing because the director had just quit. And, you know, as you're walking in, my, my buddy picks me up at the train station and we're driving in. He said, hey, by the way, since you're here, <laughs> and so I'm walking down the stage and I'm looking at them and, and they're performing, they're, they're in rehearsal already, and they're performing a, a, a moment of the show called And It Was Good Brother and It Was Goddamn Good. And I was, I was listening, but I, it didn't sound right. And I, I, I stopped the rehearsal when they stopped. I said, excuse me, could you tell me what words are you saying there? And one of the, the, you know, freshly scrubbed young children came up to me and said, oh, well, some of us were offended by, by the lyrics and uh, were personally offended. So we've changed the lyrics to hot damn good. And I said, oh, that's less offensive. And she says, yeah, we, we took a moral stance about it. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, well, did you ask Bernstein? And she said, well, he's dead. I said, my point, exactly. He created it for a reason. And you really don't have the option to recreate somebody else's art because it offends you slightly. I said, you have my permission as the director to tacit and not speak this part. You do not have to sing it. If it's against your moral fiber, then I will not ask you to do it. But you may not impinge your idea of art on my project or or the project of a, of a dead artist. So you can just mute yourself. And if, and that way, if you feel good about yourself, that's fine. And she was fine with it. And they, they had a, a, a meeting. And one of the, one of the other characters came up and said, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I'd explained myself to the cast. I mean, I didn't just say this out of hat. I said, okay, listen, guys, first off, hot damn, Gosh darn, geez, gee whiz, golly gosh. What do you think that's a euphemism for? And you think he doesn't know? Give him some credit, him, her, deity above. I said, you're not fooling anyone. You're just creating a, a tempest in a teapot for your own mor moral self-worth. I said, make a choice, but by the, you know, by the by, this is my choice. And one of the, one of the guys came up to me and said, listen, I, I, I really want to sing these words, but I know that my grandma who raised me is going to be furious when she hears it. And I'll hear about it. And I said, well, you know, that's your grandma's training. And if, it, if this is the faith of you or your faith of your grandma, you have to make a choice what you are as an artist and what you feel right about. But gosh, golly, by geez, I can't make that decision for you. You have to you have to draw the line. Are you a moral person or do you speak morally? And he made a choice. I don't know what he did. And his his grandmother hated it. But he was empowered by the power of the peace and he said I've never felt closer to my my sense of religion and faith and it was worth it to him. And for the others, I said guys, this is a passion play. The Pope said it was a passion play. And in this scene, you're the, you're the Roman guard with the spear. You're poking. That's what you're doing. These words are painful and they're intentionally painful. So we as storytellers, sometimes we have to play the part of the Roman guard. It's not comfortable for us and it's not the happy ending, but it's part of the story. And that's just what you have to do. Oh, I just love it that when you were talking about the twins at the Vatican, I had this 
sort of this thought that a quote that I've heard a million times is that you're always one choice away from an entirely new life. And think about that in terms of our stories that are unfolding every day, every moment as we live. This moment, this, this conversation is now part of our stories and will in some way shape how we move forward. And in some way, this hour will shape how we think about the world or how we see the world because we share each other's you know, perspectives and we understand things from a new angle. And I just, I love that. Um, whew, goodness. So, yeah. So one of the things that we, we sent to ask you guys about was how these different art forms either tell things, do they tell things the same way or do they tell things differently? And if, if it's differently, do they, you know, how, how are they complementary? How do they fill in the gaps where the other ones maybe don't get something exactly the right. same way? Can they tell the exact same story or are there shades that are different somehow? Um, Meredith, what is your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a lot in a question. Uh, so I would just, the first one I would say is that definitely the way that they complement, you know, we all take information in differently um, it, from a young age. And so the way that we all communicate with one another is differently. So adding different art forms together, especially when we think of performance, is has a each one has its own way that it's going to go into an individual. And and everybody also has like a little bit of a hierarchy of like what they value as good art or art that is that they want to take in for themselves or see. And so just depending on which one for everybody, there's different ones that are going to resonate with each other. You, you know, the other the flip on that flip, but another thing to think about, I loved working with Graham when I was in Colorado because the students that he worked with were really quite different than the students that I got to work with uh, on the everyday. And so when I would go into a rehearsal process, like, like the things that I would do, those took, students took it in completely different than the students that I worked with on the everyday. And I would do the same exact thing. And I would say the same exact thing. And just the way that they took it in was a, was just another interpretation. And, and then I think back, on, I think back to that time and I think to today and I think how, how much like, depending on the context and the, what was shared with them or where they're coming from also is a, is a different way that they're going to take stuff in. And so I have always, when I first met Graham, I, I remember going up to him and saying, Hey, I know that I'm new and you're somewhat relatively new. I was probably just a very awkward person. And I was like, but I think we should work together, even though I don't know who you are. And I just, I, saw that you're new and I'm new and I read a little bit about your bio and I just, I know that your department's here and my department's here and we're in the same building, but I'm just used to like music and dance being together. Like that's, <laughs> I've never not done that. So like, let's just do it. And I know maybe not everybody else does it here, but you know, it's really weird to me that they don't. So I don't know, like I'm going to make my own and cause it's really weird for me to not be working with music <laughs> and like I can work without music, but, but I just think it's a little bit easier if I do. <laughs> and I, I don't know, like, what do you think? And so I, I, I just like to, to say that they're their own individual things. Yes. Each one has a different level of training. Both have similar levels of training. Uh, each has their is important in their own regard and retrospect and they and they touch us and tap us differently but they at the end of the day they're touching and tapping and reaching people and the more that we can work together on it the more that we can like communicate on how best we can reach what it is that we want to say or to do or to who we're reaching to bring to us the, the more that we work on that together I, I, is is also just an example of how we can then do that in other disciplines and other ways of community and other ways of humanity. Like the more that we can figure out how to work potentially as an underdog, because a lot of times we are the underdog, underpaid, highly proficient, highly <laughs> skilled, <laughs> years of experience. Uh, and that, but we have to like take the back seat all the time and be like, you know, we're going to work together to figure it out. 
Like, I think that that in itself is an example of how like people that don't have the arts in their lives on a continual basis can just take that as an example. And I know not everyone sees it that way but, um, in, at, in the first moment, but I think about that a lot. Like it's for having me to like hold myself back on what I'm passionate about to make sure that we're then working together with other art disciplines. Like to me, that's, that's huge. It's such a, it's such a practice, it's a continual practice. And also for me to yeah. learn, like, I, you know, like I'm, I have this expertise over here, but I want to learn a lot more about your expertise. Like you're an expert, give it to me. Like, oh, yeah. totally. How much do you feel like other people's expertise lends to your sort of emotional communication or emotional understanding of your, of your art or of your choreography when you're working with students? Like, yeah. do you feel emotionally different about a performance when there is music, even if it's, imagine it's the same story, same characters, do you feel differently emotionally about that performance than you would if, if there were, if there is or it's not music? You know, it, um, yes and no. So I think w what Doug was talking about in the beginning was it really is dependent upon the individual. So for me, it's also whatever the music is, it really depends on the music. Like some, some music can really take certain things away and some music can really add to it. And, and if in a live performance with music, it, a lot of it really to me is dependent upon the performer. The same thing for dance. Like you can have some amazing yeah. music, but the performers that are dancing just do not, they're not there. And it's not through what, what Graham was talking about with technique, 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 and what you're talking about stuff. To me, it's like, what are we bringing to the table? And yeah. like, like for me, when I'm witnessing something, it's, it's a lot about the relationship that's happening together. Uh, when music yeah. and dance or choreography come together or like too much in the space, then we got to take, we got to take something away. Some music for me is like, no dance is allowed. <laughs> none like especially like in certain sections of operas and stuff like that like no no movement none aside from their movement like none like, to me it just becomes this over the top cheesy it's it's, it's too much because some things don't need a lot to be said to be heard to be understood so when you have right. two it's layers, it's it becomes what i call americanized mm. it becomes yep. this like not reality television, but it's like too much given to you. It has yeah. like a, Mc, a yeah. McDonald's effect yeah. to it. Yeah. Right. Oh. Well, and like there's um, Eckhart Tolle talks about uh, the like when there's a performance happening on stage, it has to be encased by silence, or else you can't hear the music that's happening. And it's the same thing. If, it, if there's too much dance, if there's too much emotion, if there's too much art, it becomes noise. It's a wall of art, and we can't discern any. A particular piece of it. Doug, what were you going to say? Well, I think uh, a lot of what I do is when I teach, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a recovering academic than anything at these days, but I, I have, I equate uh, food to, mm. to the music. You know, it's, it's easier for somebody to say, it's like, well, they're, they're working on their recital and they're very nervous about their piece and they're going to go out and present it to an audience. And I said, why are you nervous? I said, well, I, I don't, I, I don't want to screw up. I said, you're not going to screw up. You've been practicing this thing incessantly. You're going to be fine for that. Why are you still nervous? I said, well, I don't want to disappoint my audience. That's really what, what I feel about. And I said, well, if you were in the kitchen and you were preparing a cake and you took the time to pay attention to, to all of the rules of the recipe and the eggs and the flour and the, and the, the proportions are just perfect, and you baked it and you cooked it and you, you frosted it and you did everything to the best of your ability. And you walked out into a room of family and friends who chose to be in your house. And are you nervous about bringing this cake out to these people? And they said, of course not. I said, well, how much less should you be nervous about the fact that people crossed town and spent money because they want to be in the room with you so desperately? that they're going to want to justify the $60 they spent on their ticket to watch you 
and they will fight somebody to convince an, another person that I was not stupid. I have spent good money to listen to this person. They are on your team and you're presenting a cake to them. It's something of yours that you've prepared and the amount of frosting is not too much. It's not too sugary sweet. You didn't put too many pop songs in it. You didn't do what I did with my New York recital debut, put six songs about death in a row, all, all slow and make the audience hang out for 20. Yeah, they, well, I made them sit for 23 minutes. I had them sit at, at Merkin Concert Hall for 23 minutes listening to songs about love, hope, death. It was in the middle of the AIDS crisis. These were excerpts from the AIDS quilt songbook. And it worked because I didn't move a muscle. I didn't, I didn't cry into it. I just let the music do the job and trusted the material. I knew it would work. I knew it would hold, but I knew that if I looked sideways, the audience would look sideways with me. And so literally I had to stay focused at one point for 23 minutes and get all of it out so that people could stay with me. And, you know, Meredith knows exactly what that is to, to hold an audience in your hand. And once you have them, it's your responsibility to keep them. And there are things you can do to lose them. Um, and I coach people on how to, you know, how to hold an audience of a thousand people. And you're fighting the, the anathema of, of storytelling is the freaking cell phone. You know, it used to be the program. You know, when I was, when I was a young recitalist, you didn't want the audience to look at the words wondering what they mean. They want, and you wanted them to be so captivated with the mm -hmm. storytelling that they didn't care what the words were. That was the challenge. Not for, not for recitalists to look out at heads. That meant you lost because they're just following along with the words. Now we've got these things. Everybody has a weapon. This, this is the entirety of the world is available here. And it's so interesting. It is pinging at you to come look at it and go down. There's a wormhole here. And that's your challenge. And you have to be able to be still and know when, to, when silence is perfect. Because people will wait to hear what you have to say, just mm. like kids. You know, it's if you have something worth hearing, the audience, they'll wait. And I think it's as musicians um, and as dancers, we're so terrified of immobility and silence. We got to be do something. We have to do something. And th that's when you see frenetic choreography and people just throwing stuff in because, well, there's nothing going on there. What do you mean there's nothing going on there? There's music or there's silence. There's, re there's recollection by the audience for them to think, wow, this story, this, I, I understand this story, but if you're still getting input and more input and input, you don't have a chance to sit there and say, wow, this is amazing. Oh, there's more. But if you keep giving them more, you never have a chance. And then the people walk out and they haven't really understood what they've seen. And then life comes back in and said, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. And they're back to their world. But if we can, you know, if while we've got them and we don't have them with these things, we give them the silence and the time to reflect within the body of our performance. And that's, that's part of it. And I think, um, You'd mentioned earlier uh, about my performings and how I curate my own evenings. I start off with jokes. There's no better way to get an audience to cry than to get them to laugh first. Mm. It breaks the ice. It gives them permission in community. And then they're vulnerable. And then you can take them down whatever road you want. But take them down to, to some very, very sad situation at the beginning. You know, any storyteller will tell you, don't try to make them cry at the beginning. Yeah, it's, it's a dead end because then they're going to be tired and they want to go home. But if you can make them laugh, it, it works. I mean, Fiddle on the Roof starts with Tevye talking to God. It's funny. He makes you laugh. And then where does it go? You know, you're in the hands of a comedian. You trust the comedian. The comedian takes you where he needs to take you.
And I think that's, that's the nature of my storytelling. I am basically a comedian and I'd like to take you someplace that's dark and scary, but trust me first. And Meredith is the same. Um, trust me with, trust me, I will hold you and keep you safe. I love it. I love it. When you were talking about silence, I, when we were discussing this uh, the other night, this specific question, I had the thought that, um, so Charlemagne said one time about languages, he said, uh, to speak in another language is to have a second soul. And so I was discussing this in my diction class with my students this, this week, actually, the idea that you can't really say the exact same thing in two languages. You know, you can say apple, you can say milo, you can say, you can say it in all these different languages, but the reaction to what an apple is and how it's used somehow taints how we think of it. And in the arts, it's the same, that you can do a straight play of Romeo and Juliet and an opera and a ballet, and it's the same story and the same characters, but the flavor of it is somehow different. But I was so struck of when you were talking about silence, because silence is the one thing that translates in every language in the same way, in every medium. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but totally, that's like the the connective tissue between all of them. Absolutely. Meredith, what were you going to say? I was just going to add in there that the silence is also a massive amount of skill and practice, right? Uh, to be able to, to put the silence in there, because it, it's needed, but you can't put it everywhere. You, it's, it's really crafted of where the appropriate spots are for it. And, and, then, and then after that silence, what happens next? And that in itself is also a skill, it has so much skill and practice and craft within that. Uh, and so when I'm thinking of dance or when I'm thinking of music or when I'm thinking of just performing arts in general, when things are like layered and layered and layered and layered and layered and then, and then the stillness and the silence comes in and then what happens right before, what happens right after, like the, the little like bookends right there for me is something that I, is when I'm watching or listening or witnessing, I like my brain becomes hyper vigilant in watching that on in others. And then I, and I makes my, I like start to really think of like, Oh, how did that work better? Or could that, or like, that was amazing. And like, but why was it amazing? Like, what was it that made that amazing to me? Or when I look around others of how it's maybe amazing to them, I, you know, it's not just like we have silence and then something happens. Like there's, the crescendo and decrescendo of how that happens or not, or the immediacy of something that happens right after is it's, it's in itself, as Doug was saying, it's, it's something that we have to really think about. We have to practice it and then put it applied. Um, and I, to me, like when I, when we see dance and when we see performers and let's just go from like a soloist perspective, you know, some of the best performances for me, that is, and again, this is just my opinion, is some of the dancing that is actually not like a ton of heavy dancing. And when I say heavy dancing, like whacking your leg, whacking your head, dropping the body, jumping to the sky, turn, 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 what bam, like smack everything all over the place <laughs> and take up the entire stage. Like some of the, the performances that resonate the most with me is they're doing a lot of minimal movement, but they are fully embodied like to be able to like fully move your body see the person like so embodied but have such small gestural movement and then there's like stillness it's like we're, we're with them and that's because we can identify with that the person that's whacking themselves all over the place most of us cannot identify with, most of us cannot whip our head and smack our leg and jump across the space and like dive roll while turning in the air at the same time. Like That is a like, whoa, oh my goodness. But the, the ones that resonate with the, the everyday people is the ones that have the more minimal movement. And that's the ones that take the most amount of skill. That's the ones that have to sit with themselves because it's easier to sort of, be flashy because it's hiding the human. The human is the one that has to really sit with oneself to find their breath, to find their embodiment and to let their body take it on and, and then share that with others. That is a lot of fear. 
inside of there. And that's a lot of vulnerability. And that to me is like, when I see a performer, I'm like, that's the performer. That's the, that's what I want to watch. They might not whack their leg to their head. They could just put their leg out just for a sec. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for me. I can see the, I can see the audience as well. Yeah. There's so many, there's so many parallels in singing to what you just described with being able to sing pianissimo, you know, this super soft little sound, but have it be resonating into a giant hall still and have everybody hear exactly what you're saying. And just, it's the most magical way to do thing to do when you're singing, but it's, it's so much harder to do than just being loud and boisterous. And there's so much more presence required of it too. Like we have to be, in dance, I assume as well, certainly as an audience member in dance, when things are flashy, I recognize I can't be part of, I can't be present in every motion that's happening. But if someone is being slow and simple and it's elegant and like I feel their presence and I'm able to be present in every moment as it's unfolding. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, as Doug was saying. Yeah, and we also need to, people forget that like in the storytelling, and the Doug, as Doug was saying, that people need a moment to re- to hear the story. They got to, you know, you can't be like, here's my story. Ah! <laughs> They're not going to get the story. You got to take them through the story. You have to be the comedian or the storyteller. Like you have to, yeah. you have to know how to read it. And it, and that has, you know, it's on a journey as it goes. And you got to give them a moment to hear what you're saying, to be like, okay, now I'm ready. Or give me more. Or, hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the so, interesting. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Doug. Well, I was just saying an interesting thing came up. Uh, was it was last night. I, I was I had was coaching a a kid in China. Um, he has a presentation as a six year old boy. Now, thinking back to when I was six, I was I was rummaging through you know C Dick and you know Dick and Jane, and. I was talking to him about the, the term altruism and is it possible for anyone to truly be selfless in the, in, the, in the sense that if altruism is a reward in itself, is that not selfishness? I'm telling this to a six-year-old. And so, but the lesson for the, the day was he had a presentation to make for, to a couple of hundred people. And I said, what would, what would they expect a six-year-old to do? You know, he's a strange little six-year-old, granted. And he said, well, he would expect me to come out and, and look around and, and say hi. And I said, yeah. What would happen if you came out and held yourself completely still and looked at the audience and covered the audience with your eyes as if your eyes were a fire hose and you soaked absolutely every person in the audience before you said in a word. Just look around, take 10 seconds, just to cover them with your eyes and then introduce yourself. I said, what do you think that would do to an audience if a six-year-old did that? And of course, I introduced him to the concept of this being the evil competition. And he said, they might put their cell phones down and see why I'm not talking. And I said, do you think you're brave enough to do that? He said, I'm brave enough to try. Which was the sweetest and most astute thing that any student I've ever had has said. And here's the six-year-old said, I'm brave enough to try. Hmm. You know, and not, not look at success or succeeding it. He just said, I'm brave enough to try. And that's really the the element of storytelling that I wanted to share is that we're all storytellers. We are storytellers when we're at the checkout line at the Safeway talk, you know, compa- comparing notes. You know, how's how's your COVID going? You know, how's your how's your quarantine going? Um, we all have a shared experience. I've been talking to these Chinese executives. And of course, every time I talk to them, at the end of it is how's how's your COVID going? And you know, it's, we all have a shared experience. We have a global shared experience right now, which is in one sense horrific. And in another sense, it's this 
unbelievable opportunity where we all are paying attention to each other. I know what the weather is in China because we're looking at, you know, the reports from China. We're looking at across mm-hmm. the globe what's going on. Mm-hmm. And now a beyond other t- any time in the world we are so tight and connected this is a ch- this is a, an opportunity mm-hmm. and that's what i'm looking forward to coming out of this is that we've been introduced to everyone because we you know somebody sneezes in in wuhan and five weeks later we're sn- everybody's sneezing around the world and so many people didn't even know who where wuhan was right no. they didn't even know the word so no. just the, the places around the world of like who the people that inhabit the world and where they are, that is not just for one particular demographic or age, that's happening to people depend, no matter what their educational background is or their cultural background or their economic background. Like that, I'm always so fascinated and have been, especially within the past year, because I was just out of the country and was a, this time, this time last year I was evacuated from another country back to the United States. And so I just am always fascinated with what information is being shared between countries for the everyday people. Mm. And it's like, and no matter maybe what their advantages are of getting the information, I'm always so fascinated with like, what are they hearing is, and then in relationship to the country that I'm from, from the United States. And so, I just, I was, I've been amazed at the methods of sharing that's happened. And then also the dissemination of that, like medical information that people would have never known about, how to take care of oneself and others that they might have never known about unless it, this pandemic happened. Um, that, that, it, I've just been so fascinated with that. And also because I haven't been able to be a part of the arts as much. So I've had to take my head. At, like kind of like out of the arts, not in the sand, because I don't think my head is in the sand, but I've really had to just like look at the whole entire world and how we are socially communicating and, or maybe we're not. And as you're saying, Doug, like, the, like I keep my eyes on what's happening everywhere and I always have, but I definitely do a lot more now. And also not just from like, how can I protect myself? How can I protect my community? But I'm also doing it in a way of how can I then protect, like what I'm doing is going to then have an impact onto other countries. So it's also, it's not just about like me, 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 or me around me. It's also like my actions, most importantly, then affect the rest of the world because all of our actions have been so present and visible of how we have been affecting each other. And it's not that we are just now doing that. It's not that this just now happened, that the pandemic didn't make us all of a sudden affect one another. We've been affecting one another since the beginning of humankind. But we all now see it. And we all now see like all the levels of not just COVID, but like the shifts of power and dynamic that has also happened here in the United States and has happened in other countries of those shifts because there's been so much shifting of power, political power, of uh, gender, like there's been economic hardship, like there's been natural disasters have been happening. And we now know and are able to hear what's happening on all these levels because how it affects us and then how it affects each other. And this, that, that cyclical chain reaction and how we can stop certain things from the continual, that continual thing happening that's going around and around and around and around. Right. Like when we think of like Greta, she's like <laughs> um, just this like, young gal, like the effect that that young gal has made across the world to political leaders like of of something. And then it's just so I always just find it so great to then hear people that are outside of my community that are are noticing like, oh, global warming. Like maybe they didn't know about that or they didn't believe in it. And, uh, you know, and then I think and then I always and I always have think about how I can use my art or my skill set or my expertise to then apply that to sharing the information again through that storytelling of of maybe taking other people's stories and and finding another way to tell that story 
Because maybe that way that they're telling that story isn't hitting everybody. And so like, I'm inspired by that. And I want to retell that story to then tell it in another way that is going to maybe be a little bit more accessible or, or an, uh, just another way where people can take it in and then uh, see how then they can apply it into their lives. Bingo. Yeah. Love it. I think we're just about out of time, but this has been such a pleasure for us. Um, thank you for Absolutely. reminding us how, you know, what we do as artists is it's, I mean, what we say is that singing and this applies to all art, it's essential to the human condition. It's essential to humans. It's transformative. It really changes who we are and can change the lives of people around us. And it's powerful. It, it just is a powerful thing that we do as long as we rem as long as we recognize that and remember what it is we're doing and why we do it. We really, you know, we have the ability to make shifts in our lives, in the lives of other people. And when we work together on that, you know, as you saw at the beginning of this thing, we, our goal here is when we work together as artists, we heal the world. And um, so thank you for thank you for being part of that tradition. And thank you for talking with us today. Thank you. Really thank, you. Pleasure. thank you for having me. Cheers. Thank you so much, both of you. Be safe.